Hi everyone, as today's video was filmed a few days before the murder of George Floyd, and this YouTube channel is the largest platform I have, I want to direct your attention to the description box below. In there I have listed petitions, different places and ways to donate, and sources of information to help you educate yourself and those around you. Although the four officers involved in George's death have been charged, there are many others who still need justice. Join me in signing petitions and donating however you can, whether by your own wallet or watching videos where the ad revenue is being donated to relevant organizations and causes. Remember, this isn't a political issue, it's a human rights issue. Hi everyone, welcome back. Bex here today to film a video about the shortest books on my TBR bookshelf. The reason I decided to film this video is because I have recently been reading the story of Edgar Sautel, which is a rather large book, it's over 500 pages, and I know there are a number of other books for the rest of 2020 that I want to get to that are also on the larger side. And I uh, don't get through large books very quickly, as I'm sure many of you also do not. And so in order to balance that out and actually make sure that I still reach my Goodreads goal for the year, I have been reading much smaller books alongside it. And so that caused me to go through my shelves and see what I actually had that was short. And I figured I could share those with you today, because why not? I'm going to start with the longest of the shortest books at number 10 and work my way up to number one or the shortest of all of them. Interestingly, the first three books, numbers 10 through 8, are all the exact same number of pages according to Goodreads and the edition that I happen to have. The first of these books at 288 pages is The Line Becomes a River, Dispatches from the Border by Francisco Cantu. This is a memoir about Francisco's life growing up alongside the U.S.-Mexican border, also working as a border patrol officer for four years, and then his decision to leave uh, working as a border patrol officer but still living near the border and how that can affect so much of your life. I haven't heard many people talk about this book, but I'm very interested in reading it. Number nine, also at 288 pages, is Sometimes I Lie by Alice Feeney. This is a psychological thriller that I definitely have seen around on booktube. I've heard mixed opinions of it, so we'll see. But this one is about a woman who wakes up in the hospital and she can't move, uh, she can't speak, but she can hear everything that's happening around her. And she can hear her husband and her sister talking and she's trying to figure out what happened to her, and then there's also this other mysterious person who comes and visits her bedside at night. So she's trying to figure out what the heck is going on, and also she's an unreliable narrator because sometimes she lies. Number eight, and the last of the 288 page books, is The Life and Times of the Thunderbolt Kid, which is a memoir by Bill Bryson. I have read a lot of Bill Bryson. I haven't read every single one of his books, but I've read a lot. And I bought this book back when I was still very into Bill's books. Recently, I haven't been as in love with them. To be fair, some of the ones that I've read more recently are some of his older ones, and sometimes I find the stuff that he talks about to be rather insensitive. <laughs> but I am still interested in at least giving his memoir a try, especially because it is so short. This is about his life growing up in the 1950s in Des Moines, and he does always joke about how he came from like the middle of America, middle of the 20th century and sort of, you know, somebody had to come from Des Moines, so it was him. And I think the Thunderbolt Kid is like this personality that he made up for himself, this story that he made up for himself when he was a kid. But I think it'll be um, a nice way to sort of go back in time and just get a little glimpse of what life was like at that time in that place. At 286 pages, I have Bella Tuscany, The Sweet Life in Italy by Francis Mays. This is by the same author that wrote Under the Tuscan Sun. This is a companion novel to that. This is about her time in Italy uh, in the springtime. So she has taken a sabbatical from her uh, job and she goes to Italy and has a house there 
that she's renovating and it's about living life in Italy at that time. The, you know, the food, the landscape, the people, all of that. This is one I've had for a long time. It showed up in my oldest books on my TBR video recently. So this is one I would really like to try and get to ASAP. Coming in at 278 pages, we have The Mockingbird Next Door, Life with Harper Lee. This is by Maria Mills. This book came out 2014-ish, I'd say, and I did receive it from the publisher. But then there was a lot of controversy about the book because the author spent a lot of time with Harper Lee, actually, apparently with Harper Lee's permission and her sister's permission, moved in next door and sort of shadowed them in their life, uh, late life anyway, living in the Deep South in Alabama. Because there was some controversy about it, I shied away from reading it at the time, but now that it's been a number of years, I am interested in checking it out and sort of understanding the greater picture of what's going on with this book and why it was so weird at the time. All that being said, I still like the idea of a snapshot of Harper Lee's life uh, living in the Deep South. Number five at 277 pages is Digging to America by Ann Tyler. I really love these editions. I believe was it, it's Vintage Anchor Emblem Canada. That's what it says in the corner here, but I just remember seeing these on display at Indigo, but I just love the look of these. And I had never heard of this book before. I just picked it up because of the cover and I liked what I, read on the back. This is about two different families who meet when they're waiting at an airport to pick up their adoptive daughters from Korea. One of the families is sort of quintessentially American, basically. And then we also have an Iranian American family, and, I, and both of them are adopting a Korean-born daughter. Their friendship that's created at this meeting at the airport, you watch how it changes over many years because they are brought together in this moment and how their backgrounds uh, can create these deep divides, but also things that bring them together as well. At 274 pages, Butterfield 8 by John O'Hara. This is one of the Penguin Drop Caps editions which are beautiful. I only own three of them, and I've only read one of the three that I own, uh, so probably should get to this one. This is a book that was published in 1935, and apparently when it was published, it was a sensation. It's about a man and a woman. The woman wakes up in an apartment, in a stranger's apartment. Her dress is torn, uh, she's disheveled, and she decides to steal a fur coat from the wardrobe in order to wear it home. And this unleashes a series of events that apparently end in tragedy and it's based on true events so inspired by true events around that time which I find very interesting so it focuses on this young woman who steals the fur coat and also an affair with a married man you know 1935 I guess that was quite the, the scandal at 249 pages is Douglas Copeland's Eleanor Rigby I love the bright pink of this I'm not really a pink person, but I enjoy it occasionally. And this one is about a woman who is in her 30s and she just feels like her life is incredibly boring and nothing amazing is ever going to happen to her. But one day she witnesses the passing of a comet and then this man shows up and he is wearing makeup and fishnet stockings and he has Eleanor's name and number inscribed on the inside of his medic alert bracelet, which sounds so odd. But that kind of fits because the few Douglas Copeland books that I have read have been kind of odd. That's just his style. So this will be a very interesting ride, I'm sure. The penultimate book in this list at 224 pages is Half Wild Stories by Robin MacArthur. This is a short story collection written about Vermonters, many different Vermonters from different uh, backgrounds and over 40 years. I'm just telling their stories of what it's like growing up there, living there, and surviving. I had heard about this book from Mercedes over at Mercy's Bookish Musings. Last summer when I went home to visit my family in Vermont, I went to one of the local bookstores and saw this on sale there and thought, this is the moment, I have to buy it. Uh, so I am really looking forward to reading this. I don't always love short story collections, but because of this one's Vermont element, I feel like I'll automatically like it a little bit more. Lastly, the shortest book on my TBR shelf 
at 208 pages is Moon Tiger by Penelope Lively. This book I had never heard of before. I believe I picked it up at a library book sale mostly because it's part of the Penguin Modern Classics uh, collection, which I also love these editions. I have a few of these. You can see some of them right here. Uh, this is about an old woman who is on her deathbed really, and she is reflecting on her life, um, her husband, her child, her lover. I feel like this is going to be in the same vein as The Seven Husbands of Evelyn Hugo and Lillian Boxfish Takes a Walk where it's just a really wonderful story about an old woman reflecting on her life. Those are the 10 shortest books that I own that I still have not read. If you have read any of them, let me know what you thought of them down below. As always, all of our links are in the down bar. You can go check those out if you feel so inclined. Thank you guys very much for watching, and I'll see you later.